Hi, I'm Murray Deeker. Runner's World chose him as the greatest athlete of the last 100 years. He won nine golds at the Olympics and one silver, and of course he won eight golds, one silver and one bronze at the World Championships. He is Carl Lewis. Of all of those, which one gave you the most pleasure? Well, um, having the opportunity now to look back at the whole career, it would definitely be the last one. I mean, the uh, gold medal in the Olympics in Atlanta was tremendous. Uh, it took a lot of people, a lot of support to get there. But also, um, it, it, I knew it was the last time I'd ever do it, so I, I felt that I probably wanted to cherish it more. So it was the most special. And when I set the world record in 91 at the World Championships in Tokyo, was the biggest world championship medal. Which is the hardest event, the 100, the 200, or the long jump? Oh, no question, the long jump. I mean, it's not even close. <laughs> you know, it's, it takes so much more work. It's a much more technical event. I mean, the 100 meters is, is a rhythm-oriented event where you get into the blocks. You, if, you're, if you're in the right position, right out of the blocks, and in a set position, if you're in the right position, and drive off the front block, the race is set. I mean, that's it. But in the long jump, you can do everything perfect, but the variables of wind, different conditions, different types of track make everything so much more uh, difficult. So uh, that event is much tougher to prepare for. So your record is absolutely amazing. I think you've got more golds in the track than this country has got. And I look at it and something must get Carl Lewis buzzing. Something must motivate him. What is it? Oh, I mean, I tell you, I, I've been fortunate to be in an environment from day one when I went to the University of Houston that enabled me to be successful. I mean, I have arguably the best coach that ever lived, Coach Tom Telez. I'm with um, the Santa Monica Track Club, one of the best clubs ever. Um, I've been with my same manager, Joe Douglas, and that management team. And I've trained on the same track, I mean, my entire career. So I've been able to be in a stable environment that enabled me to focus on just being the best that I could be, and that's given me a big advantage. But, Carl, lots of other stars change them. They change their coach, they change their manager. You've been with Tellus, you've been with Douglas, you've been with Santa Monica since day one. So it says a lot about your stability too. Well, it says a lot about my stability and even more about divine intervention. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, the Lord placed me in the right place at the right time with people I cared about. You know, when I was young, my parents always talked about finding people you trust and believe in and you can work everything else out. And when I went to the University of Houston, that was a lucky thing for me. I mean, I just made that choice and went down there. But from that point on, I was a little bit more mature and I was able to select people that cared about me. And we grew up together with the club, with Joe, with all of us. And I, I can't imagine being able to compete many years, changing environments, changing coaches, changing teams. Um, and that, to me, has been the most important facet of my career, that stability. In reading about your career, the one thing I can't follow is Santa Monica is miles away from Houston. Your right. name is always associated with the Santa Monica Track Club. Well, what happened in 1980, Coach Telez, my coach at Houston, introduced me to Joe Douglas, who was the manager of the, of the Santa Monica Track Club, and I joined the club. Well, at that point, we all believed that there was a philosophy that we have to have coaches and people that work together to put, prepare the athletes and get them to the meets. So Coach Telez basically became the sprint coach because I was in Houston and Joe managed middle distance and distance runners and since then most most or almost all of the sprinters have eventually come to Houston and the middle distance and distance runners except for a couple of quarter milers are in Santa Monica it's a great system because the coach has input on the competitions not just a coach who's unconnected with the other idea Coach Telez does not care about how much money we wake or, or where we go he just cares about our competition and the meets we run you see, there's no controversy in Carl Lewis's background until we get to Atlanta right at the end and the American press and public wanted you to run the relay. How did you feel about that? Well, I mean, I knew, I've been in this sport a long time, 17 years, and I knew that all the way through it, it wasn't going to happen because I just know the vindictiveness of, of our sport and the people that run it in, in the United States. Um, it was an amazing story because there really wasn't much to it. Either you run it because a coach says you do or you don't. So it's one of those things where there's really nothing to talk about, so it takes on a, a life of its own. Um, it was therapeutic for me in the end because I wrote a book this past year about the entire season. And I looked back on it and I said, well, there's really nothing that could have been done. The coach all along knew what he wanted to do, but he refused to tell people. So it really created the media, put them in a position where they had to start making up stories and creating things to make this an interesting issue because there wasn't much to it. People just wanted to see me run or they didn't. That was really the bottom line, and he had a decision whether I ran or not. But it was amazing how so many stories came out of this, this one little basic issue. Are you an open book? You're talking about him hiding things, not talking openly. What about you? 
I'm pretty open, I would say. I mean, I've been around a long time, and it would be very difficult for me to hide much after all these years. And, and I haven't really tried to because um, I just live the life that I was raised to live, and I do the best I can, and that's it. And um, I do acknowledge that I, I think I've done some pretty good things in my life and also made mistakes. But that's a part of the maturation period in life. But I don't think I did anything major. And I'm very happy with the life that I've lived and accept every moment of it and would do it exactly the same way if it came, it came out again. Who's the toughest competitor you've come up against? Well, I'd say um, definitely when he was healthy was probably Leroy Burrell. I mean, because he knew me well, um, he trained with me every day, and he did uh, what it took, and he knew how to run the race. Another guy that was interesting was Joe Deloach. We didn't run against each other very much, but he probably ran the best race of anybody against me in any competition. So those two are probably the better. And then a few years ago, Mike Powell was, was a very good competitor, but, but as he got started to compete more and get injured, it wasn't as easy for him. But I would say those are probably the two best pure competitors I've run against. I talk to hundreds of sports people, and they, at the end of the day, the elite sportsman always says that for success, you've got to have it right up there. They say the top three inches. And I look at sprinters in particular. How much do you spend, how much of your time, psyching the opposition? Well, you know what? Coach Telez has coached us from day one to not worry about anyone else or anything else other than the very specific issues we have to perform. When I get in the blocks to run the 100 meters, um, I'm supposed to clear my mind when the guy says set. And then when I go up to the set position, I, all that thing I do is listen for the gun. And then I ex drive off the front block accelerate to a running position and maintain. That's, that's the only thing I worry about. We're supposed to be oblivious of everything. But there are sprinters who do get, try to get into the heads of others. But I've always found competing well, running well, feeling good, it gets in their heads better. If someone comes out and starts yelling and screaming and trying to disrupt you, that, yeah, that may get you off your race. But if someone goes out and runs 989 in the first round, that disrupts their total life. <laughs> so um, I've never worried about trying to psych them out before, and I know how to do it in the damn race, you know. <laughs> The real gun golfers say the same thing. They play the course, they don't play the opponent. Are right. you saying that? Absolutely. You don't. You play the course, you play the race, because if you step up to that starting line and everyone's personal best is 10 one seconds, let's say, and you go out in the first round and run 10.05, well, I think you just eliminated every single body person out there. And, but if you talk, 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 it gives them the confidence that you may not have your act together. So it's best to do it right there on the, in the performance. Ali's name will always be associated with Frazier. To some extent, your name is always going to be associated with Johnson. What was it like to be on the blocks and be against a drug cheat? Well, I mean, it's a part of our sport. It's a part of our culture. And I think that one thing that we have not done is associate drug use with the overall drug use in our culture. Um, they've tried to separate it in winning and losing. It is not winning and losing. 80% uh, or more of the athletes that take performance enhancing drugs also use recreational drugs. So it's not a win-loss process, it's a, it's a drug use process. For me it wasn't easy, but it was a motivating factor because I've always felt, because my coach told me from day one, if you train right, you do the right things, you can beat a drug user. So that was my motivation all along. And, and obviously Ben ran incredible, he did a great thing. But as you can see, doing it the wrong way, whether it's through drugs or cheating or anything, you're never gonna be happy because you never feel like you've achieved the best you can achieve. You know that it's the drugs a part of it. So Ben kept taking more and more and more, and finally too much. So that's the thing, you never really know what you're gonna be like. And, and I couldn't imagine ending my career now saying, I wonder what, how good I really was. How prevalent is drug use in the top athletic world? Um, I would say it's always been a, a small percentage. I mean, a lot of people wanna say it's big percentages, but a lot of people want attention too. They wanna to be quoted worldwide. But it's always been a small percentage, but it's definitely prevalent. People took drugs in Atlanta and got away with it. People took, take drugs every day and get away with it. Some are caught, but um, some are not. But I think that there are ways we have to constantly uh, change in order to try to close the loopholes. It's funny how once they started random drug testing, a lot of people started having training camps. It's funny how when they started random drug testing, a lot of people started having two places to train every day. You know, I'll train here for three days and over there for two days. Um, we need to close those loopholes, have you announce one place. If you're going to be out of your town for more than two or three days, you must announce where it is, when you're going to be there. And that's one way to cut down on a lot of these training camps where people are running away hiding and taking drugs and competing. And that's obviously not everybody, but people are doing it. I'm conscious through my own work in drug prevention that you've done an incredible job in the United States with young people. What was the motivation for that? 
Well, for me, it was, it was twofold. I mean, I had friends that I graduated with out of high school, one in particular that went to college with me, um, and he used to smoke, you know, smoke marijuana. And I saw just, you know, they say, oh, marijuana is nothing. Well, I saw it destroy the career of a very, very talented athlete, a guy in high school who ran better, ran under 14 seconds and under 37 seconds in intermediate hurdles, top three in the nation, and it destroyed his career. So I saw the power of the drug use then, and then as I got older, I saw people taking it and cheating, and I realized that we shouldn't be in a society where kids will be confronted with whether they should use drugs or not to be successful. Um, and I felt that was going to be a huge problem if we didn't start working on stopping that problem now. Bob Beeman's log jump record. You finally broke it. And I think, if my memory serves me correctly, somebody else broke it the same day. Right. Give us the rundown on that, because that was a real barrier, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, for me, it was interesting. I always felt that I could break the record. And that day, I, I learned a big lesson, because I had run a great 100 meters, and I said, I'm going to go break the world record today for the finals, and I'm going to retire from long jumping. End the discussion. That's it. So I went out, and by the third jump, I'd gone past the record. And I said, I have three more. Let's just take care of this madness put it away and I'll never jump again. And then on his fourth jump, you know, Mike Powell comes out and jumps the record. And it was basically a foot farther than he'd ever really jumped. And he had an incredible jump, great performance. Well, it's funny because the next two Olympics, I ended up winning two more gold medals in a long jump. So I, I found out two things that day, learned two things. Number one, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And number two, um, never say never. <laughs> so uh, I learned my lesson that day, and, and obviously I'm the benefactor. I d didn't get the record that day, but I, w I was uh, the benefactor and definitely um, would have um, traded that record that day for the two more gold medals. So You mentioned it. your Lord twice. Are you a deeply religious person? Well, I'm a, I'm a spiritual person, I would say yes. And um, I think obviously it's a very personal relationship. Um, I'm very open with people that are interested, but at the same time, I'm cognizant of different beliefs and different people's feelings. I also understand that there are different motivations and there are different religions and different ideas. I just think spiritual uh, reality for you is what's most important, and whatever it is that makes you happy, I'm fine.